to fusion, uh, not as a fusion scientist, but somebody who's spent their life in the energy industry. So I really look at this thing from a trans transformative energy solution rather than a, a, some type of science project. Okay, cool. Well, we still wait for some. Are you supposed to get a signal or? Well, um, <coughs> it says that actually, we will in uh, one minute just simply start and then uh, we. Yeah. Is, is it or, uh, let's wait another uh, minute or so and then uh, we will start with the introduction. Do, do we see who the attendees are on the right? Uh, you can see it I can on see the upper right. Uh, you have now uh, six participants. Okay. Well, you we see now one. that uh, yeah. hmm. one has already followed us. And there's a second one, uh, maybe in a minute or so, or uh, actually we can just simply start. Uh, we all work on a better future for the planet. And in this session, we try to concentrate now on uh, this uh, issue, impact of private capital in the energy sector. Is there a need for more capital? Is there a need for more innovation, inventions? And maybe the first question goes to Evelyn. Evelyn, uh, can you say uh, something about uh, innovation and the energy sector and explaining what are you looking for? Sure. Uh, we look at uh, innovation across industries and across sectors, so definitely also at the energy sector. And I would agree with both of those things. We need more capital and we <laughs> need more innovation. But definitely there are a few things going on, at least in the transition part of things, uh, along the lines of the circular economy. I think we're not quite there yet when it comes to the cheap, clean, sustainable energy future. The, the reason we're here now or in the situation in the energy space is we, we ended up with the cheapest way to do things, right? And a long time ago, that was actually an innovation. Um, so I'm looking forward to what the other participants have to say on their respective technologies, but I agree that the private sector plays a, a, a massive role here. Maybe, Chris, can you say something about uh, do we need more private capital? Uh, you're in a, an area where uh, maybe one could expect uh, that uh, something like fusion, fusion uh, uh, plans are maybe more a key area for basic R&D and should be financed by governments. Uh, what do you Safe. Well, uh, yeah, so I'm the leader of uh, chief executive of General Fusion. So we are one of uh, what is today 30 private fusion companies that have started in the past 20 years. I think we were one of the first, but uh, it seems that every year a few more private fusion ventures get added. So, you know, your your premise there, I would agree with. I, I think governments um, are responsible uh, and need to be responsible for basic uh, science and research in in various technical fields. Uh, what you see now in fusion is uh, a shift from basic uh, science research to uh, the effort to commercialize the technology. So uh, this, this opportunity has really moved beyond basic research and is now uh, into a phase where people are trying to commercialize the technology as a clean energy solution. But there is always a trend for, uh, let's say, short-term returns with minimal risk. Uh, how can you, Chris, attract, uh, be attractive? Uh, how can you attract private capital uh, to your company? Yeah. So I think, you know, very early uh, there is there is venture capital out there for early-stage uh, companies doing this, the smaller amounts. Um, 
And at the very end, when the timeline to commercialization is, let's say, less than five years and very clear, um, then then I don't think there's also a, a, a big challenge on the private capital. The, the challenge is in this middle space. And so, you know, what we see is uh, increasingly, and this is something that I do think will hopefully continue as a trend toward the larger institutional funds, sovereign wealth funds that are being motivated by ESG principles, by their governments and, and, and those who who fund those institutions uh, to make investments. And so this is where I think the focus needs to be, the large institutional capital uh, sources that have ESG mandates, that have more patient money, and that look in the longer term. Uh, Andrew, maybe uh, if you have left ABB and, uh, and are now uh, an in followed an investment company. Uh, can you say something about uh, the need of more capital, private capital in this sector? You're still muted. We desperately need more. We desperately need more innovative solutions, right? So we, we've got some solutions, uh, you know, wind and solar, which which are now cost competitive with many types of electricity, um, but they're not going to get us to, to carbon neutrality in, in 2050 or any other uh, time frame. So in the, you know, we can look at all the sectors, but in the electricity sector, uh, what we desperately need is, you know, carbon free 24-7 uh, electricity, which, which of course, um, you know, general fusion, that, that, that's their goal, right? Um, and, and, you know, they may, may make it, they may not, but, but certainly we need to be funding um, lots of companies like, like general fusion. Um, and, and that's just in the electricity sector because we don't have all the solutions that we need. And if you look at, you know, um, uh, biofuels, for example, um, you know, we have first generation biofuels. We have second generation, which still need a lot more investment, a lot more private capital to get them to, um, you know, when they're cost competitive with, with other types of existing existing technology. So absolutely, we need private capital because we need more innovation to get us where we need to be in terms of uh, CO2 emissions. Girish, uh, you work for a huge uh, giant in the uh, traditional energy sector. Would you agree? And how do you get uh, management attention to uh, make a drift in the strategy of total energies? Well, we don't need to get management attention. Management attention is already focused on it right now. Uh, as you know, the European oil and gas company is much further ahead in terms of moving away from fossil fuel dependence. And then Total, I would say, is the single furthest away. And in fact, last week, uh, we had a shareholder resolution whereby we changed our name from Total to Total Energies to reflect the fact that we're going to be large. And in fact, our ambition is to be one of the top five uh, producers of electricity through renewable energy. Uh, we have a huge solar business. We have a huge uh, wind business. We are now going very big into hydrogen. Uh, I am in the middle of raising a $2 billion hydrogen f infrastructure fund along with uh, Air Liquide uh, because we feel the time is right to kickstart the ecosystem. Uh, we are very active in, our, uh, uh, in carbon capture. Uh, we have declared our ambition for scope one, two, and three for the next few years. And we have declared our ambition to be generating at least 35 gigawatts of renewable energy uh, by 2025. So from our perspective, we know where we are, where we want to go. My own role is, as head of Total Energy's Ventures is to invest in early stage and late stage technologies which are driving energy transition and which are driving uh, carbon neutrality. And we can chat about that. Yeah, maybe uh, let's stay there. Uh, uh, is your target primarily a strategic uh, goal or is it performance or is it a contribution to the new perception of total energy or how would you weigh uh, these three goals? Yeah. So the way, the best way to explain it is if you're a financial VC, 
you have only one criteria, which is how much money can you make? Mm. You know, you put in a dollar, you want back five. It's, it's, you know, how you define success is quite simple. If you're a corporate VC, uh, the, how you define success becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, you do want to make money, uh, but you're not looking to maximize your return on investment, but you want to make a decent return. Uh, and you want to invest in something which is strategic to you. Now, how you define strategic is up to you. You can make it very narrow. You can make it very broad. Uh, you can engage, you know, something close to what you do, something further away from what you do. So it's up to you. And we have a third requirement, which is not only do we have to make money and it has to be strategic, but it has to contribute to carbon neutrality directly or indirectly. So we have a pretty specific, you know, we have three concentric circles, sort of which, you know, intersecting circles and our target is, is, is pretty narrow. Uh, but that hasn't been an issue for us. I mean, there's this amazing number of opportunities out there, not just in electricity, but biofuels and mobility in energy storage. We're starting to look at things like, uh, uh, even plant-based meats, you know, because the whole negative carbon stuff is very important. Nature-based solutions, carbon capture, etc. So the opportunities are just humongous out there. Evelyn, in your fund, uh, you're looking for uh, for innovation for uh, for uh, sectors where you perceive uh, the true uh, disruption of uh, traditional business models. Uh, would you uh, also invest in uh, fusion technology nowadays or is it too to, far away for you? We're looking. So what we do is we work with the private sector and also the venture capital sector or industry practitioners that are active in that field that are spending more money than they're making yet to to be aware of uh, when things actually come into this phase of commercial application. So in the fund, in, in both the strategies that we have, small, uh, mid-cap and, and also large cap, we don't have much exposure to energy as such as a sector yet. Um, definitely to kind of the renewable energy infrastructure, also to companies like Nesty, who have actually managed to at least move, you know, in the direction of the lower carbon intensity fuels and, and uh, changing the way, uh, uh, changing what we actually consume in, in energy production, right? And creating a little bit of a circular economy there as well. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we've yet to see larger companies that have strong balance sheets. Uh, BP Total, probably the European ones are the first ones to move in that direction, uh, the, the European side of things. Uh, but since we're a listed equity strategy, uh, we're missing, um, you know, in the larger uh, energy space, that kind of transition. And so we will watch uh, also the fusion space and, and, and try to understand what the value chain, what part of the value chain is making money. And, and if we see something there, we'll try to invest definitely in the listed space. Maybe, Chris, if you can add uh, to the question, of what is actually the role of private capital? Uh, is it uh, just being passive? Is it uh, uh, too too passive? Or is it uh, how do you perceive uh, the influence and the impact of private capital on your company? So I, I think private capital has a very important role to play. You know, we, we are fortunate in that we have a very broad spectrum of funding for our company, uh, pretty unique, actually, that uh, in addition to, of course, uh, Canadian government support, uh, you know, we, we have significant government support from other, other countries as well. And that's going to be increasing here in the near future. Uh, we're going to be ready to make a big announcement around that regard next week. But beyond that, um, you know, as I mentioned, there's this institutional capital, but then we also have private equity, venture capital, um, and, and impact investors. And I think there in total, the, the role of private capital is to basically filter in the marketplace and to discern which, which technologies are, are ready for commercialization and which aren't. Governments are not very good at making those type of decisions. But I think private capital is, uh, is a great filter uh, for doing that type of thing. And so I think it's a very important role that it has to play. And one of the things that I think private capital uh, is really important for in this is, uh, is making 
uh, a determination of which technologies are available uh, and that can scale to relevance, right? There's, I think, um, what, what the good news is, is that there's been, uh, I think, a bit of a shift in the past few years away from maybe not very kind to say it this way, but let's say feel good investments in, um, in energy uh, that, that sound great, but really don't uh, ultimately have the ability to scale globally, right? To address the climate and the, uh, the decarbonization of the energy industry at scale. And uh, I think with the increasing urgency now, there's a recognition that the path has to be done with something that can be done at scale. And so this is around an addressable market, which is global. And in that regard, private capital has a very important role to play. And we see that inclusion because that's one of the value propositions of fusion. And Andrew, uh, with your role also a bit in the investment banking area, you also eventually uh, uh, create through your transactions, a steep learning curve. Uh, what do you believe? Uh, how can private capital, how can uh, also M and A, how can a better geography of uh, of uh, technological innovations uh, do um, have an impact on uh, this uh, transition in the energy sector? Yes, yeah, great question. I, I think. You know, as, as Chris said, go governments don't don't select the best winners, right? And the great thing about about private capital, especially venture capital, is that they're you know they're placing lots of bets, right? So, you know, a, a typical VC is is maybe hoping for for a one out of ten, you know, to pay off big time, right? Um, and and you know that that's the kind of success rate they're looking for. So we 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 don't know which are going to be the great technologies of the future. We don't know which are the companies that are going to, that are going to be able to turn those technologies into successful businesses. So it's great that private capital is kind of able to do this spread betting, right? And, and, and then we let, we let the market, we let the, the, the entrepreneurs, um, you know, pick the winners rather than, rather than governments. Of course, You know, private capital, they should also have a role in, in helping people to be successful. And certainly uh, the best, you know, the best VCs, right, help help um, help the companies to to get pilot projects, to get commercial traction. They give advice. They they help with recruitment and all that all of that kind of thing. But I think the key thing is that that, you know, venture capital create and private private money creates competition. And it's that competition that ultimately creates winners, and it's those winners that that can really make a make a kind of make the needle change in terms of uh, CO2 emissions. Do you agree, Kirish? You know, let, let me sort of set out, if I may, the spectrum of potential investors in the energy space, and I think it is very unique to energy because you don't really need that in software development, you don't need that in a whole bunch of energy technologies. And, and, and the reason for that is the time it takes for developing new technologies and the time it takes to adopt these technologies is much, much longer and the capital intensity is much higher. So the issues around energy tech innovation are far more complex and different than any other uh, sector out there. Okay? So to begin with, you have the government. You know, whether it's the RPIE or whether it's the national labs, etc., who are doing fundamental research, foundational research, basic research, and a lot of great ideas are coming out of that. Let's not forget things like EPS and C and you know the CT scan and, and and you know the HTP language. They all came out of national labs, okay? including, by the way, fracking technology. A lot of people don't realize that a majority of the IP in fracking technology, which is often held as the example of private initiative is actually held by the U.S. government. Okay? So there is the government part. And the government is not just about funding. It's also about providing subsidies, feed-in tariffs, contracts for difference, et cetera. You would never have had wind and solar reach grid parity today if the earlier projects did not have that kind of support, right? So that's the government side. Then you have the venture capitalists who obviously provide money and, you know, companies like General Fusion, etc., and, and they are the ones who try to take the good from that. 
The limitation of the venture capitalists is they have a 10 year window, five years to invest, five years to harvest. And, you know, whether it's biofuels or fusion technology, et cetera, it doesn't fit into that five year window or the, you know, uh, a seven year, 10 year window. It takes much longer, right? And then you have the corporate venture groups, which function somewhat similar to the ventures, but we don't have a constraint about we have to get out and distribute our money and therefore a lot more patient and know the technology, know the infrastructure, can provide the support from a marketing technology perspective, etc. And then you have the family offices who are a lot more patient. You have the break, you know, the, the breakthrough energy people, you have uh, you know, people, companies like Prime Organization who do the investing, more patient, etc. But then there is the other organization which also people need to get familiar with. For example, the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, which was initially created by the 10 largest oil and gas companies about four or five years ago to invest in climate change issues. And they created a billion dollar fund where each of the oil companies like Total, Repsol, BP, Shell, etc., contributed a hundred million dollar each to to invest not just in companies but also in projects in areas where there has been market failure such that either it's too risky or too expensive for any one of us to do it on our own we're doing it collectively and then two years ago you know chevron exxon and, and occident also joined and now we're sort of seeing some of that play out in the plastics arena with the Alliance for Plastic Waste and other things. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm raising the $2 billion fund in hydrogen, again, an industrial strategic fund. So what you will see more and more, hopefully going forward, is funds being created by people from within a se sector, within an industry, patient capital, you're willing to address not just financial, but strategic and I think that's going to be a very important part of how we address energy transition going forward. I can agree with that, actually, with both things. Also what Chris said, right? Uh, we speak to institutional investors uh, and have so for, for a while. And uh, we've never seen so much demand or so much patience, actually, and willingness to, to invest in these kind of projects. And uh, they're asking us to, to ask to look for these kind of investment vehicles that focus on impactful investments, private investments, etc. And I think we, we forget one investor that isn't a willing one, but the end consumer will, will finance quite a bit of this transition as, as the regulator steps in and, and sets some standards. So obviously it's not a lot of money, but it's a, it's a huge responsibility yeah, yeah. as well, and we'll see that along the way. So if I can add to that, I think, uh, and I, I agree with what you both said as well, that, you know, there's three factors at play here when you think about this, right? One is uh, the timeline. Um, the second is the size of and the certainty of the addressable market. And the third is risk, right? And so I think where, where uh, companies, you know, strategic industrials come in is where the risk has been reduced through development in R&D to a manageable level where there is reasonable confidence that the technology, broadly speaking, will be commercializable, can be industrialized. And then that kind of, and if there's a large addressable market, that makes up for a bit of the timeline, right? And so I think that's where I see fusion having evolved now, right? And and a great a great analogy is really what's happened to commercial access to space, right? Where for 50 years, it really was basically a government-run business, uh, not cost-effective. And frankly, that's partly an artifact of the available technology. And, you know, with the advent of things like 3D printing, of things like high-speed digital flight control systems, you know, you can do things like land a rocket back on Earth that you could never do for an infinite amount of money in the 1960s. And this is what has changed in fusion, that the science of fusion has matured, that you have a suite of enabling technologies that was not available before that allow the technology now to be ultimately commercialized. We're still talking about uh, something that's not two years uh, if you're optimistic, it could potentially start to happen around the end of the decade, but the, the risk has gone down because people understand what's happening here. And so there are some 
very, very credible shots on goal uh, to getting this thing commercialized. Yes, it will take more time, but this gets back to the at scale opportunity. You know, the, the global market for, for fusion is probably on the order of a trillion dollars a year because the promise of fusion is the cost competitiveness. And ultimately, uh, you're looking for a technology that can uh, displace coal primarily as an on-demand uh, energy source. And that's really what you need to address globally. And this is a technology that can actually do that. And so I think in totality, this thing brings this thing back to a place where you're shifting from venture capital to the strategic industrial type investors and the large venture funds and family offices. You know, but the one area where we still struggle for financing, I mean, the concept, as I'm sure you know, of the value of death. There are plenty of technologies which have done well in the lab and which are done at a prototype stage, but are not bankable today and cannot be commercialized because to build a, you know, five megawatt plant with the latest turbine or the five megawatt plant with the latest PV or a one ton a day uh, plan for a uh, new uh, you know, biofuel is just way too expensive for the average VC firm uh, and it's too risky for some of the others. And so that's one area where I think there is a gaping hole and lots of, and so when, when somebody says, should we be putting more money into innovations? My answer is why don't we first make sure that the innovations which are knocking on the value of death they have the ability to be commercialized. They have the ability to be bankable before we start you know, putting too much money on the early stage because all that will happen is they will all come to the value of death and just wait there. Yep. Yeah, and in that regard, I think for these long cycle technologies, uh, whether it's space or, or in this case, fusion, actually the path forward is really, um, and, and I think this has been proven out time and again, is through public-private partnerships where you have a role of private capital, whether it's, it, and that by that I mean a combination of pure investors and strategic industrials like yourself together with governments, right? Because this is where you get this uh, connection between energy policy in this case, right? And the desire to achieve uh, net zero carbon uh, which is a government-driven policy. And out of that come programs that can partner with private industry, let private industry show up with their with their check and therefore make the votes, and, but, but share the capital required to get over this valley of death that you're talking about in the late stage. That's, just, that's the path to success. I mean, that's kind of where we are at General Fusion, again, with these government public-private partnerships that we've been able to establish. But that's really this path forward here that links up private capital with the forcing functions that are coming out of uh, governments through energy and public policy. Yeah. Girish, if we talk about the impact, I mean, uh, Evelyn just mentioned the maximum pressure of uh, – uh, which comes from uh, big investors uh, in a fund, uh, pressure on the sustainability. Having uh, already some uh, proven innovation, there is probably on a, on a huge oil and gas trade, or such as uh, total energies, there is a huge uh, pressure on an existing carbon intensive business model and i mean you have to adapt to these innovations is, is that well the answer simply is yes we have to adapt and total has been ahead of the curve we are not doing this thing because we are under pressure we recognized it years ago but at the same time you have to also be pragmatic about this discussion because I mean, let's step back and say look one of the easiest ways or the best ways to reduce carbon uh, impact is to electrify a lot of things. Okay? Now, lots of things like cars and ships and other things may potentially can be electrified, but you still can't electrify things like airplanes today, you know, from the energy density and the weight density, etc. of things. Uh, lots of industrial processes which need extremely high temperature, whether it's cement or, or steel or aluminum, etc., can't be electrified. There just isn't a resistant material today which can generate that kind of temperature. So you have to move to things like hydrogen, etc. Uh, you know, so yes, even if 
hundred percent of the cars sold as of today will be electric, you still will have a very, very, very large number of cars and trucks on the road, which are still internal combustion based. So for them to over time disappear, uh, will we will take time. So we fully understand and agree that we have to start moving aggressively. But on the other hand, the future cannot suddenly be uh, electric. You know, that you still will need fossil fuel. And the question then becomes, do you, if you, you know, there's a very interesting article in the New York Times over the weekend, which is who are the largest methane uh, emitters in the U.S. today? And they are the small oil and gas companies to whom the large companies have sold their assets. So if all you're doing is forcing the Totals and the Exxons and the BPs to get out of fossil fuel, the Russians and the Middle Easterns and the Venezuelans will be more than happy to continue, but at a far less, you know, uh, responsible manner. So the answer is not just to get rid of this, you know, just to force the oil companies, but to make sure that on a unified basis, it makes sense. Otherwise, all you're doing is moving the bump in the carpet somewhere else. Yeah, and that's a really good point. And this gets back to what I was trying to say. You said it in a better way, Girish, that there's these kind of feel-good investments and feel-good policies. I mean, electric cars, you know, the batteries are storage, right? And so by themselves, they do nothing for climate change and they do nothing for uh, – or they don't necessarily do anything for decarbonization if the electricity that's uh, being made to charge these cars comes from a coal plant. It's actually probably worse. So you you really have to think um, deeply and broadly about what your what the impact of these policy changes and investments are, and whether you're making them for purely financial gain or whether there is an ESG component here, because then you really need to think about what Gears is talking about. Andrew, with your industrial background, uh, many years, uh, do you perceive uh, those uh, big companies as uh, learning fast enough, or are they just uh, too, um, yeah, not not really adaptive uh, to the new situation. And uh, maybe if you can also say something about the geography, uh, is is what we do enough here to get a better future for the whole planet if we do it in, in the US or in Europe, uh, but uh, still uh, burn some coal in China to, uh, yeah, to... Um, great electricity. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, I think I think we we are we are of course trying to, you know, get technologies to a point where they can be compet cost competitive, you know, anywhere in the world, and and that may mean, you know, that we need government subsidies for a while or or public private money, as as Chris explained. Um. And, and I think by by doing that, we, we we hope to get yeah companies or technologies that can be competitive wherever. Um, and obviously, different different countries have different you know issues, right? Um, you know, China has has been getting to a, a certain level of development, and, and in order to get there, they had to rapidly increase the amount of electricity consumption, and and they did so for a long time using the, the cheapest way possible, coal. Um, that's exactly what 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 the U.S. did. It's exactly what Germany did just just many years before. Um, uh, at, the, at the same time, you know, over the last few years, China has also become, um, you know, the biggest um, builder of of renewable power plants, um, solar and wind. Um, so and and also the biggest producer today of 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 electric vehicles. I think one one important point is, you know, we, we have to have the final goal in mind. I think most scientists agree that somewhere around 2050, you know, we, we need to be kind of carbon neutral uh, as a planet, right? And we need to kind of stay focused on that, on that long-term goal. So the short-term steps that we make today in terms of 
you know, we, we could do something today to cut 10% of emissions, um, you know, by, by, for example, switching from coal to gas. Um, and, and maybe, you know, that could cost a lot of money, but that's maybe not the right thing to do in terms of being on a, on a sustainable path to, to carbon neutrality. So I think when we think about the big companies, right, uh, the big companies that are big enough and, you know, Total would be an example of a company that we very much hope to be around in 2050 and be playing a, a very important role. Um, we hope that the path that they take, right, um, is, is a path that, that leads us to this car- carbon neutrality goal and uh, not a short term uh, kind of, you know, 10 percent improvement. But then we've gone down a dead end kind of pathway. Evelyn, how optimistic are you and uh, how optimistic are your investors? For, for the energy transition, I mean, yep. they're, they're very willing to find uh, things to invest in. I would speak to what Andrew said on, you know, not kicking the can down the road, but there is a way to, to do that and solve maybe other problems along the way, right? Switching to biofuel, switching to waste or plastic burning isn't the cleanest solution, but it's a cleaner solution along the way, and it solves another problem, which is a waste and a plastic problem. And then along the way, I guess what, I, what our investors are looking for currently is, is the, the circular economy element and a world in which we, we change the way we produce things, you know. Um, so plastic is just fuel trapped in a plastic bottle. So, so those kind of waste situations are an issue that our investors are looking to solve along the way with this. Um, so as much as I can say to that. If we would uh, look back in 20 or 30 years, what, from that point of view, uh, what should we have done better today? Um, maybe, Chris, uh, do you have an idea? Um, that's, uh, <laughs> that's an impossible question to answer, so maybe I'm free to, uh, to say anything I want about that, right? Um, I think that uh, what we should have done uh, differently was uh, embrace the embrace this challenge uh, at uh, at an earlier time. You know, I think uh, there there will be a regret uh, around the world that uh, the world didn't get serious about making serious changes earlier. Uh, so I think that I think the the right moves are starting to happen. Uh, they will happen. Uh, but I think we will have some a lot of catch up to do because of the late start. I actually agree with what you said before as well, Chris, uh, uh, that new technologies are converging together. Right. And I think also investors might regret something. So we might regret things along the way or at, in a, after the fact because we didn't get to where we wanted to be in, in the clean world. But I think we're sometimes underestimating how far along a lot of these technologies are. And if some of them converge together, even investors uh, might have wished that they were now moving into fusion, now moving into hydrogen, where it doesn't feel as doable uh, as you think. Because once things are applicable, they move extremely fast. And you can also make a lot of money along that way. Yeah, I think the phase change uh, when it happens will happen and is happening very quickly. And I think there will be a lot of investors who wish they had invested in fusion, uh, you know, now instead of waiting five years from now. Right. Because I think uh, it will be a lot more expensive to get into the game than that. This it really feels like a transformation is happening. Uh, if you look around the world at what's happening in fusion, lots of people just see what's happening with the big government programs. And that that masks this incredibly vibrant private industry that is just growing exponentially. The private capital going into fusion is growing exponentially, by the way. Uh, so that, uh, you know, it's uh, it's over a billion and a half dollars now. So uh, it's it's growing very rapidly. And obviously, uh, private enterprise is a lot more efficient, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, when it comes to commercialization. So. Uh, a lot can be done and is being done with that capital. And ball is moving down the field very rapidly right now. 
if I could add something there, I, maybe a little bit controversial, but I think in 20 years we're going to look back and say, why on earth were we so obsessed with software in, in 2021? Um, I think we're going to realize that software was great, but it's not going to solve the Earth's biggest problems. And if I relate that back to, to what Gary said, you know, those big problems that we have right now are going to need hardware. And, and, and we're going to need to, to build, build those commercial demonstration plants. And, and that's going to require uh, some capital, some big capital. And we're going to need to find innovative ways uh, to supply that capital. Yeah. You know, to, to me, if I, you know, the long list of things we can talk about. But for me personally, I think the one thing we might regret looking back is not more aggressively pushing nuclear. I think we're making a huge, I just don't think we can get to the point that we want. If we want to electrify everything, there just isn't enough land mass today to put solar panels and wind turbines to get the amount of energy we need. Okay? And I recognize and I understand that there are challenges around nuclear. Uh, certainly, you know, uh, help nuclear fusion with more funding, but even from efficient side, whether it's small modular reactors or whatever, I think with, with Germany sort of pulling back and, and the U.S. really not doing very much, I think we're missing a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yep, agreed with that. It's, uh, you know, there is there's no uh, single magic bullet, magic solution here. I, I, I also agree that nuclear fission has a role to play. Uh, it's more difficult to scale that because of the regulatory uh, requirements associated with that and, and just the, the capital and the economics, uh, which is really ultimately what the promise of fusion is, right? So that's, that's the, the next nuclear, right, that, that has all of the, the good attributes of, uh, of nuclear fission, carbon-free, on-demand, but, uh, you know, also has some very differentiated things around safety and, and economics that really promise to be make it the, the long term solution. Right. But to the degree that we can make some shorter term moves here. Uh, but that window is closing because as fusion gets closer and closer to commercialization, you know, the it, it's hard to make that that choice. And, uh, you know, I think that the first companies, the first companies will be putting a shovel in the ground on on commercial pilot by the end of the decade. I, I really think there's enough players in the game. I mean, not just us, but others that, uh, you know, I think there will be some very credible options doing that. And so that's not far away, right? And that is not far away at all. Can you maybe, uh, Chris, also say something about uh, the global competition in your field? Is it uh, just among Western uh, startups? Is it among... Uh, uh, Chinese and Indian uh, startups as well. Uh. Yeah, very interesting. So, uh, you know, the, the ecosystem of private fusion ventures is primarily in North America and Europe. Uh, what you are seeing on the government side, though, is a number of governments are pivoting from just pure R&D to trying to repurpose their technology for use in clean energy, right? And... Um, <laughs> I think the UK is trying to do that. They have a program called STEP um, and the Chinese are doing that. And I think there's a few other countries that are trying to do that. Um, it's, but I think it's a speed thing, right? When you get to the point where private capital is, is coming in uh, because they can see that the timeline to commercial revenue is within a reasonable window, um, I don't think you can be private enterprise, right? But you need a... You need a relatively mature uh, underpinning of science, and that private industry did not develop. The private industry stands on the shoulders of decades of, of this government R&D. And you need this kind of a broader set of enabling technologies to make it practical, right? There's a difference for fusion between being able to make fusion happen and being able to do it in a practical way that's applicable to clean energy technology uh, deployment. And that's really what's different today and that's really what's propelling the growth of this private industry. So today, it's it's Europe and uh, and North America. We're, we're we have an increasing presence in Europe ourselves uh, because of both the energy policy and 
the innovation that happens there, right? And I think that's the strength that you see in the ecosystems in Europe and in North America. So it doesn't really surprise me that the private uh, companies are really primarily in those two regions. Gurish, uh, do you have, uh, from your corporate venture capital uh, point of view, uh, geographic focus or uh, are you open to any innovations anywhere in the world? Uh, yes, we are geography agnostic. Uh, we invest in, you know, we have a team in San Francisco. We have a team which manages in, in Asia, um, uh, Europe, of course. Uh, we have a separate team, which we refer to as the Emerging Markets team, which has a slightly different focus, which is they invest in Africa and other developing countries, but more around energy access and sustainable mobility. So people who are living off grid, you know, rooftop solars, biodigesters, microgrids, etc. So the team focuses on that. So we have a little bit of both, yes, but we do invest globally. Okay, the time has elapsed. Uh, maybe Andrew and Evelyn, a last word from your side. Andrew? Yeah, I, I guess um, private capital is playing an important role in, in the energy sector and, and um, we, we, we're looking for innovative ways for that, that role of private capital to expand. Yeah, I'll repeat what I said before, that uh, investing in, in several of these uh, new energy technologies, amongst them fusion, probably pyrolysis, I'd say, waste to fuel technologies as well, but also some of the ones further down the line, um, as an investor can, can get you further than you think, because a few of these things are, are close to, to making you a lot of money. Okay. Thank you very much for your participation in this panel and hope to see you again. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.